So welcome to Reverse Engineering Video Games for Localization and Preservation. A little bit about me, I kind of went through this, but here's some of the games that I've worked on. Uh, all three of these are PlayStation 1 games. We have Dr. Slump, Racing Lagoon, and in development right now, I have Aconcagua. These are probably not very famous video games because of course they've never been released here in uh, the West officially, but uh, they're being, the games like this are beginning to pick up steam and are kind of getting folded into the public consciousness. So localizing a video game without the source code. At the end, we're just changing text, right? It should be easy, simple. I should be able to load up the game in notepad and change all the text right there. Well, not quite. <laughs> um, the entire process of localization begins with asset extraction, getting all of the game assets out of the disk, out of the game disk, editing it, and making sure that you have a plan of to reinsert that data after you have extracted it. So where do we even begin? Imagine you just had a disk and someone told you, give me this in English, what would you do? Well, let's put it in our computer and see what shows up. Uh, so this is Racing Lagoon. If you put it in a disk drive, this is what shows up. Now these files, from our previous experience, we, we know a little bit about them. We know that this DA folder contains red book CD audio. We know this movie folder contains STR video files. Uh, this is the main executable right here. And this contains some boot up information. But the real meat of the game is stored in all of these bin files of which there's basically nothing that could help us. Uh, there's no standard format here. There's no way to, to, to look at these files and immediately know what they are, how they're organized, and what they do. These files are bigger than two megabytes, two megabytes being the entire uh, memory size of the PlayStation 1. That tells us that these aren't individual files, but entire directories. There are many, many files stored within these larger packages but how can we separate these files and interpret them the way that the game interprets them? Well, we have a few tricks we can use. Uh, the PS1 uses CDs as its storage medium and CDs have a very particular method of storage. All of its data is stored on sectors, sectors that are evenly sized and placed one after another on a huge disk spiral. The sectors themselves have a certain structure to them. The PS1 uses mode 2 form 1 sectors and mode 2 form 2 sectors. Mode 2 form 2 is used, as far as I can tell, exclusively for audio and video. And so the files that we're interested in use mode 2 form 1. As you can see uh, at, the, at the top of the sector, we have some track information. At the end of the sector, we have some error correction information. But the data that we're interested in here, the user data, has a specific size, 2048 bytes or 800 in hex. The smallest unit of data that the game can load off a disk into memory is one sector. That means every file, the amount of space it actually picks up on the CD has to be a multiple of 800. But a file might not use up all of that space at the final sector that it's loaded, that it's stored at. What happens to the space between the end of a file and the start of the next sector? Well, it kind of depends game to game, but typically it's filled with zeros. And we can use that information to separate the files. Here we have one of the packages. And here we have what we believe to be the boundary between one file and another file. As you can see, if the file starts here, we have a whole bunch of zeros before it, and the file starts at a multiple of 800. But how can we extract all the files? Well, we, we assume that the game is storing the all of these addresses somewhere. It reads from a directory and knows how to separate the files. So this value, 0B0C6000, has to be somewhere in the game. And if we search for it, we find it. Here it is right here. 
the PlayStation 1 is a 32-bit little Indian system. So the byte order is reversed and we expect that the address is to be four bytes in length. But there's something off about it. Can anyone see what's, what's off about it right now? There's something wrong. It's that it's 8B0C6000 instead of 0B0C6000. What does that eight represent? Why did we, we, we can see that this does indeed seem to be a directory. It's a list of numbers going up. But what could this eight mean? Well, in the binary representation, we can see that it seems like one single bit has been flipped from zero to one at the start of this address. What could it mean? The game is, the game is telling us that there is some flag being flipped for some files, but not all of them. We can see that some of them don't have an eight. Some of them have the zero as you would expect. So what could it mean for this file? It means that the file is compressed. So that brings us to file compression. Why does the game compress files? Well, three reasons really. It saves space on the disk so you can store more assets. It reduces loading times because decompressing a file is actually much faster than loading a larger file. And it obfuscates the data so that uh, an opponent company can't quite steal your secrets. But we're craftier than that. We can get those secrets anyway. How does compression work? Well, compression exploits patterns and redundancies in, in data to reduce file size. Things like repeated bytes, things like repeated strings of bytes. And there are certain types of file types that compress better, like images and text. Text will have repeated words that compress well. Images will have periods of, uh, for example, like many hundred blue pixels in a row that would compress well. But certain file types like video and audio are already kind of compressed by nature and the game uh, stores them uncompressed because there's no real point to compressing them. You wouldn't get a very good ratio of data size. So there are a few different compression algorithms that were popular during this time in the mid late nineties when this game Racing Lagoon was made. Uh, the first one is Lempel Ziv Stores Zemansky, which most people call LZSS. Uh, I always find, find, found it funny that some guy named Store wrote a storage algorithm. I guess it was his calling. How this works is when a certain piece of data is repeated, it isn't stored but only a reference to where it was first encountered is stored. For example, we have the famous poem, Sam I Am by Dr. Seuss. The second instance of Sam is not stored as Sam, it's stored as this location size pair, five, three. What this is saying is we go to the fifth letter and we copy three characters. So instead of storing Sam, we can store these two numbers that represent Sam. And right here after that, we have I am, which is stored as zero four because it's the first four characters. And uh, we're, we're kind of rushing through this, but uh, um, if, if, if there's any questions about any of this stuff, uh, feel, free, free, feel free to ask. Uh, another compression algorithm that is widely used at the time is run length encoding. This is much more basic. All it says is when you have a string of characters or letters or bytes, all you do is store the first one and the number of times it's repeated. So here's eight A's in a row becomes A8. There are six B's in a row, so it becomes B6. And there are two C's, it becomes C2. Really simple. But to actually uncompress and then later on recompress these files, we need more than just these general algorithms, more than these ideas. We need machine accurate compression down to the last bit and byte or else the game will simply not run. How do we get this algorithm, this perfect algorithm that the game uses? Couple methods. One is data analysis. We can run the game in a debug emulator and monitor memory until we have both a piece of compressed data and its corresponding uncompressed data. We can then do perform data analysis on both of those and find the differences and the encoding that the compression uses. Here is the actual uh, 
document that I used for the compression algorithm of, of ra compression algorithm of racing lagoon, which in fact uses both of the compression methods that I talked about before. It uses both LZSS and run length encoding. The other way of uh, getting finding a compression algorithm is by using a debug emulator and disassembling the machine code. Using this emulator, we can place, place a breakpoint right when the game starts to read the compressed data. That, in theory, should put us at the very top of the uncompression routine. We can then take that code, that block of code that runs right after it stops, analyze it, and get the compression algorithm. Here's one I did for a different game. We have the, 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 the PlayStation 1 is a 32-bit MIPS, has a 32-bit MIPS processor, and so that's the type of assembly code we see here. After that, it's as easy as writing our own compression tools in our language of whatever we choose. So we have all the files that are separated and uncompressed now. Now what? How do we find the text files, the things that we're actually looking for? Well, one method is relative searching. We expect to find in a text encoding that the letter B comes right after A and C comes after B and so on. So we expect the data pattern to look like something like if A is zero, B should be one, C should be two and so on. It should follow that pattern. Relative searching uses this assumption to find text. So we, we can play the game until we find English text on screen, for example, here, and then perform relative searches for the relative searches on a memory dump of the game when this text was encountered. Here's the relative searching program. And indeed, if we do the search, we do have a hit. File number 1358 in the package event.bin seems to contain this text. All we searched for was line, but what came up was hotline, and then a bunch of characters, and then speed. If you're wondering what this piece of text came out in English after being translated, it's, it's this. This game uses kind of very, very poetic style of writing that can often be pretty funny. So we found the text files, great. But how do we actually read them fully? using more than just English, because remember, these are Japanese text files. What text encoding is it using? Well, it turned out that it wasn't using anything that we knew of. It was, it was using its own text encoding. Uh, it wasn't using shift JIS, which is the standard Japanese encoding. It was using its own proprietary format. So I had to actually transcribe all of these thousands of characters by hand into a file like this one here on the left that showed a mapping between each byte pattern and each character. But once we had that, we could apply it to, to the data itself, the text file, and have a fully extracted script, like, like here on the right. If we have the mapping of bytes and characters, and we have the text itself, we can get the script. But how do we edit them? When editing, there are a number of things that we need to worry about because there's no guarantee that after we have edited it, that the game will actually read the file correctly. Let's take a closer look at the text file itself. Well, it turns out that that text file was storing more than just text. It was storing the entire scene logic for the scene that the text appears in. Things like what sound effect should be played, what graphic should appear, what video should play, so on, so forth. The game was keeping track of the location of this block in the header. However, it was also doing some more calculations elsewhere in the block itself that made it so we couldn't actually move that block. Why we needed to move it was because here's the structure of the text file. At the top, we have the header. Next, we have the text. Then we have the scene logic. And then we have, like we said before, the empty space until the next sector. This is a problem for us, and actually a huge problem, because English is a much more verbose language than Japanese. We need more space, more space than the game 
used initially for this text block. Now, normally we'd be able to expand these files, have them take up more space, but it turns out that this game was so highly optimized with how its memory was put together that expanding the file actually crashed the game. So we had to do something to move this scene logic data to be first after the header and for this text to be right before the empty space so that we could use both this text block and this empty space block to store the English text. To do this, we had to modify the game code itself. With our debug emulator, we could keep track of when it was performing the calculations that, was, that it was using in that scene logic block. How we solved the problem was we took this empty portion of the header and injected our own value and used that value instead for these calculations, giving us enough space, uh, get, allowing us to move the blocks around and giving us enough space. And that brings us to graphics. The PS1, uh, you can see the VRAM right here. It has a very particular structure. If you look at the VRAM number one here, we have the frame buffers. There are two of them because it's, it's double buffered for image quality. It stores its images in this section here to the right, and it stores its color palettes here at the bottom. The reason that the color palettes and images are separated is to store space. Uh, palleted images uh, can be stored, uh, uh, take up much, much, much less space than images that use the full color range of the PlayStation. So the, the, the SDK for the, PS1, for, for the PS1 specifies a few standard 2D image formats. We have images containing color palette data, images without color palette data, uh, animations, and basically background tiles. Now the problem is the tools for uh, editing these files only exist for the TIM image format. Uh, apparently nowhere on the internet do, the, do there exist uh, programs for editing these other ones, except for the original SDK itself. Like here I have it running in a Windows 95 uh, virtual machine. Uh, and so these tools exist, but obviously it, it's not going to be ideal for our uh, ideal for our needs, as nostalgic as it might be. But luckily, we also have the documentation from the original SDK that tells us how these file formats are put together. For example, for this animation, we can see some information on how the header is structured, how its uh, flags are structured, so on and so forth. So let's write our own tools. If we know how images and color palettes are loaded by the machine and how things like colors are referenced, and we know how the format is structured, we can unpack these images ourselves. So here we have an instance of a TIM image that gets loaded into VRAM and the subsequent animation data that tells us how to put the image together. And that gives us an animation. Here's one from a game called Harmful Park. Uh, there's actually a graphical glitch going on with this animation. I don't know if you notice it. At first, I thought it was my program that was at fault here. But uh, there's this little bit right by this uh, antelope's ear that looks wrong, that looks broken. W what happened there is actually the artist who was creating this uh, sprite sheet actually put this one little character too close to this antler graphic. And so I had to actually reload, load up the game to verify it myself. But yes, this graphical glitch is present in the game itself and wasn't just because of my tools. So are we done? We can now edit all the 2D image types that are specified in the PS1 SDK. Can we crack open any PS1 game that we want and extract all the images? Well, no, <laughs> we can't because developers constantly look for ways to improve on these things and optimize formats and workflows. Games have proprietary formats. Here's one where that was used in Racing Lagoon that I never quite 
was able to crack 100%. I couldn't find the reconstruction information. At best, I could find the raw GPU calls that are drawing these images to the screen. But I could never find, find a way to actually reconstitute it to how it looked. But here's how it works. Basically, for an image like this, and I'm talking just about this character right here, not the background with the cars, is that the game will place a grid on top of the image and then go down from the top left downward and only store squares that have graphics in them, that have pixels in them. So it'll store these ones and then it'll go down the next column and so on and so forth. So for this example, only the squares colored in red would be stored. Another wrinkle on top of that is that if a square contains only repeated data, it will not bother storing that square. It'll just reference another square that can be copied over to it. So was all hope lost? I needed to edit these images in order, in order to translate the game. There, there would simply be no way uh, of doing it otherwise. So I really did not want to have to painstakingly comb through it pixel by pixel. What could I do to actually edit these images? Well, it took some getting creative. So here's a scene. <laughs> What's funny is this is the final scene of the game. Up to this point, I never needed to actually mess with this format until the very, very final scene. Uh, so we have this text graphic. My idea was I'm going to erase all of that text and I'm going to replace the, each square with a number or a code and then inject that back into the game and have the game run and see how it looks. That gave me something like this. I now had a code for each and every single little box that was being uh, drawn. So I could write text according to a horizontal line. For example, here, M9, MG plus seven. I could write text and match it up with a horizontal line of, of, of the grid. And then I could take the letters and copy them into the grid. And that, in the end, actually worked. I had it set up in Photoshop to make it as easy on myself as possible. And so that I didn't have to manually move anything around. I could just write in the text. And that's how, <laughs> in the end, we got the job done. Uh, there are more challenges to localizing video games. For example, here we have the name entry screen. Uh, there's a problem here. Uh, in Japanese, names typically only have up to four letters. And here, for both your last and first name, it only gives you four letters of space. We had to make a lot of changes to the screen uh, in order to get proper English names to, to actually work in the screen. What about 3D? In the, in the first project I did, uh, Dr. Slump, uh, there, were, there were actually a lot of fans of this series, which was created by uh, the creator of Dragon Ball Z, Akira, Akira Toriyama, that didn't like the main character's hair color. This hair color turned out to be colored by using vertex coloring. And so I had to, to look up how, uh, how exactly this was being put together and use a hex editor to actually change the hair color. That is... <laughs> We haven't even touched on any creative challenges that comes with localizing video games. For example, here's a bit of, uh, here's a case here at the top here is the original graphic. The bottom here is uh, the graphic that I came up with to replace it with. And as you can see, a lot of these games use very intricate pixel art and replicating it is very difficult at times. Uh, there's also the, the, the idea of maintaining tone and uh, basically the vibe of the game. Here's an example from Racing Lagoon where the text is almost nonsense. It uses English in a way that is non-standard and, and weird. And a lot of people were worried that this kind of vibe was not gonna be present in the English translation, but we tried to do our best with some of this stuff. Uh, Squid Game was in the news uh, quite a while ago uh, because its subtitles were not accurately matching 
the words that people were saying. Localization has many, many, many difficulties associated with it, and even big companies can get it wrong. So why do I do this? Uh, well, the library of games released in J Japan, but never in English is colossal. It is absolutely huge. The number of unique and fascinating titles that it has is, is huge. And some of my favorite games are games that were never released here. Of course, you also get to feel like a hacker archeologist when you're doing this kind of work. Maybe some of you could, could relate. And that brings us to the end of the preamble. Are there any uh, questions at this point? <laughs>